Hello everyone. I'd like you to meet Winston. The statue's life-sized, I'm just really short. If you don't know who Winston Churchill is and why somewhere like the Australian National University would have a 12-foot statue of him, you should probably go and have a quick Google. I'll wait. There are very few other people who you could argue had more of an impact on the 20th century than Winston Churchill. I'd read a lot about his exploits during World Wars I and II, but until recently I didn't know that he had a deep interest in science and technology and published popular science essays on topics ranging from evolution to nuclear power. In 2016, one of Churchill's unpublished essays was rediscovered. It's called Are We Alone in the Universe? And in it, Churchill considers the possibility of extraterrestrial life. Churchill's reasoning is surprisingly prescient and has all of the hallmarks of a modern introduction to astrobiology. He begins by attempting to define what life is, with the idea that the central characteristic of life is the ability to breed and multiply. Though he notes that things like viruses show the limitations of this definition, and so he restricts his focus to more familiar multicellular life. Next, Churchill points out that all living things of the type we know require water but he remains open to the possibility that other as yet unknown biochemistries may exist. But then, as now, we have no evidence of these other biochemistries, and water still guides our search for life throughout the solar system. After deciding on the necessity of liquid water, Churchill then defines what today we call a star's habitable or Goldilocks zone, the range of orbits around a star where it's not too hot or not too cold for liquid water to exist on the surface of the planet. He also notes that a planet must have enough gravity to retain a thick and useful atmosphere. With all this in mind, Churchill concludes that Venus and Mars are the only places in our solar system other than Earth where we are likely to find life. He uses the criteria he came up with to reject Mercury and the outer planets, as well as the Moon and asteroids. Writing this essay decades before the first space probes were launched, there was no way for Churchill to know that Mars has a very thin atmosphere and Venus a boiling hellscape not suitable to host life, or that the moons of the gas giants might hold all of the key ingredients he had just determined to be necessary. Churchill then looks further afield and wonders about the possibility of life elsewhere in the universe. He notes that our Sun is just one of billions in the galaxy. Despite this, Churchill reasons that solar systems like ours are likely to be very rare, because at the time it was thought that planets are formed when dust and gas are torn off a star by another passing star, which is a very rare event. But Churchill shows healthy scepticism of this idea. He points out that binary star systems are very common in our galaxy, and if two stars can form in orbit around each other with such regularity, why not a star and planets? In the essay he says, I am not sufficiently conceited to think that my sun is the only one with a family of planets. And he concludes that there must be a large number of planets of the right size and type to support life. Modern astronomy supports Churchill's conclusion. Missions like the Kepler Space Telescope have shown us that there are around a billion Earth-like planets in our galaxy. But there is one aspect of Churchill's essay that I hope soon gets proved wrong. Because of the vast distance between stars, Churchill says that it is unlikely whether we will ever be able to know whether they house living creatures or even plants. Churchill was also familiar with the astronomical discoveries of his time that showed that our galaxy is just one of billions in a vast and growing universe. The essay concludes, With hundreds of thousands of nebulae, each containing thousands of millions of suns, the odds are enormous that there must be immense numbers which possess planets whose circumstances would not render life impossible. On a more sombre note, he says, I, for one, am not so immensely impressed by the success we are making of our civilization here that I am prepared to think that we are the only spot in this immense universe which contains living, thinking creatures, or that we are the highest type of mental and physical development which has ever appeared in the vast compass of space and time. Decades later, the quest to find life beyond the Earth is an endeavor that captivates both scientists and the public. 
Simulations suggest that both Mars and Venus may once have been habitable, and rovers and satellites scour Mars for evidence of life beneath the Martian soil. In the coming decades, we will launch probes to look for life on the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, and as our telescopes get bigger and more powerful, we may soon be able to glimpse the signature of life in the atmosphere of a planet orbiting a distant star. The fact that Churchill first wrote this essay in 1939, although he updated it nearly 20 years later, shows that he was cannier and far more far-sighted than many other politicians, then or now. He was a leader who understood that brains and research were just as important to winning the war as bombs and bullets, and that advances in science and technology were the way to bring prosperity to his beleaguered nation and to a rapidly changing world. Churchill was enthusiastic about science and was an advocate for research and advancement in science and technology. His government funded laboratories and projects that made many world-changing discoveries in fields ranging from medicine to genetics to astronomy. In the early 1940s, he became the first Prime Minister to hire a science advisor. We live in a time where anti-science sentiment seems to be growing across much of the Western world. In the US, the Trump administration is enacting policies that ignore decades of research and expertise. And in Australia, we do not have a minister for science. Today, our political leaders could learn a lot from Churchill. Develop strong science policies, hire science advisors, and pay attention to them.